I want to talk today about photography and how photography came about and how the technology of photography changed mass communications, art, culture, really changed everything. So photography is a Greek word, or two Greek words, light and drawing, photos and graphe. So it really means drawing with light. If we look at a timeline of communications, we can see that photography comes to be right here in the first third or so of the 19th century. This is actually the first photograph that still exists and it was taken we don't really know if it was 1826 or 1827. A French inventor named Neeps took this photograph by putting his primitive camera uh, in front of a window and this is the rooftops in Paris that he recorded. This photograph is actually at the University of Texas. I've actually seen it myself and it's pretty amazing to know that we are almost 200 years of photography. So when photographs first became available they were not able to be printed on paper. So the very first photographs that were used in a mass communication sense were actually used for illustrators to look at them and then to do their illustrations based on the photograph. And typically the process would result in a wood engraving which would be used like in books and then eventually into newspapers. Later techniques involved in printing allowed the use of photography but this is where it first started and it really just started using photographs like this one which was taken by Matthew Brady, who later became very famous in the Civil War as a photographer. This particular photograph was used to create an image that was used in printing. So as photography became more and more in use in terms of actually documenting what really happened, then illustration kind of changed and it wasn't in, as important that the illustrations used in mass communications like newspapers for example uh, be depicting reality because the photograph did that so illustrators changed and did things that were more fanciful or fictional or just from their imagination but even now there are circumstances for example certain court trials do not allow any photography or video and you can see illustrations of the activities that took place in the court as a way of getting people in to see what happened on that particular trial. One of the things that happened in the later part of the 19th century was the technology that developed for taking photographs it was then sort of transferred into another technology that eventually became motion pictures movies and this is a part of a sequence that was taken by a British photographer I think he was actually Scottish Moybridge and Moybridge was working for Leland Stanford, who was this California really wealthy industrialist railroad tycoon, and there was a bet, and the bet was when a horse gallops, is there ever a time when its feet are completely off of the ground? And so Moybridge set up a sequence of 24 cameras, and they took 24 photographs that were placed in this type of situation here and you can see right in these two that the 
all four hoofs of the horse are actually off the ground. So that was one way that motion pictures sort of started. Uh, there was a French inventor named Marais, and he created a camera that would take a burst of sequential photographs. And this is his device, and this is one of the photographs that he would take. So he would aim this and then some activity would take place, in this case a pole vaulter. His camera would get this image that captures the motion. This is one of his most famous photographs and up at the upper left up here we see this cat being dropped. And what this documented, and this was a point of contention was will the cat land on its feet and the answer is yes. American inventor Thomas Edison was able to take some of the technologies that had preceded and incorporate them into a system that was both a camera and a projector and basically reproduced vision in the same way that the phonograph that he had previously invented reproduced sound. So this was a huge deal and this is really when movies started taking off. Now let's go back to just pure photography. This guy over here on the right is George Eastman and in 1884 he developed a type of film that was flexible and had a paper backing to it and was able to be rolled up a couple years later he came out with this early version of the Kodak camera. In 1900, the invention that really moved it ahead, and this is really typical of innovation. Remember, invention is creating the actual device or system or whatever it is, and then innovation is moving it into reality so that people can use it. So Eastman came up with the film and came up with an early camera, but in 1900 he came out with a Kodak Brownie camera that sold for one dollar. And it came loaded with his film, and then you would take your photographs, I think there were about ten or so that you would take, and then you would literally mail the camera to Rochester, New York, and it would be processed and then you would get your camera back along with the photographs that you had taken and the camera would be loaded with another roll of film. So he invented the camera and he invented the film. He sold a lot more film by making the cameras inexpensive. Now as photography evolved, it really changed the artistic side of things. Art also changed photography as well. And this is a typical kind of relationship that comes when a technology is introduced. There is a kind of a two-way of the culture, in this case art, and the technology. So with photography coming along, it first debuted as art in 1851 in London and even more significantly a couple years later at the World's Fair in Paris, France and there was a photography exhibit with some French photographers who were displaying their works as art. It was very, very controversial and the traditional artists really pushed back on it. And they basically said that this form of photography was just commercial and it was a machine and it would just reproduce common life and all its ugliness. And as artists sort of responded to create their paintings, for example, in a more realistic fashion, uh, they were criticized. So Courbet was a very well-known painter and he was ostracized by his peers because his work looked like it was too much like a photograph. Now, photography did become an art form, and into the early 20th century, there were some photographers that 
took it seriously enough and made efforts to make their work more creative and less documentary. And Alfred Stieglitz, the guy on the right here, was one of the main perpetrators of this new movement of photography as art. These are two of his photographs. The one on the left is called Steerage, and it documents this common scene of a ship with immigrants on it arriving in New York. The photograph on the right, which is a portrait, is famous painter Georgia O'Keeffe, and O'Keeffe and Stieglitz were actually a couple for many, many, many years. And Georgia O'Keeffe is a very well-known American painter. This is uh, a photograph he took of her. And as you can see, it's not documenting her. It is an artistic statement, the way she has her hands placed, the fact that her head is cropped to where you are just at her eye level. Uh, the contrast between the clothing and her skin and all that makes it a very artistic statement. Now, photography brought us realism, and of course, where this really started coming into play was in war, and during the American Civil War, it was horrifying, really, to see uh, the death as it was depicted by photographers, because it was so real. Now remember, at this time, a lot of the newspapers were actually making woodcuts and other forms of printing that were, in fact, illustrations based on the photographs. But the photographs themselves circulated around and people saw them. So what does this mean for the artistic side? Well, you know, it wasn't necessary anymore to have painters depicting the realities of portraits, for example, of noble people or the typical scenes uh, that were basically biblical in nature, which were the common themes of painters for centuries. Uh, they were freed up. And also another invention on the side really helped with painting, and that was the invention of the paint tube, which allowed paint to be mixed, put into the tubes, and then sold. So rather than having to mix all the paints themselves, uh, painters from the mid-19th century on had the advantage of having tubes. Of course, they could mix the colors of the tubes together to get specific shades and colors they wanted. The Impressionism movement started in France in 1874, and some of the more famous early Impressionists were Monet, Degas, and Pissarro. And they were able to kind of get away from just this documentation and portrait type work and explore light, color, and emotions. And they began to be more focused on what was out there amongst the common people. So this is Claude Monet, and as you can see, it's not realism, it's not like a photograph, it's distinctly an impressionism painting because it's creating an emotional connection, an impression. This is one called the Haystacks. Edgar Degas was known for his painting of ballet and ballet people. And again, you can see that there is an element of realism here, but it's very much more impressionistic. Now, as the Impressionism movement moved onward in time, the painters became more bold and more likely to just deviate from the realities. Again, photography was the reality. Why would you paint a photograph? You don't need to do that anymore. So this is Vincent van Gogh and his famous Starry Night. It's one of my favorite paintings. Other painters, such as Picasso, who was also a sculptor and an illustrator, he began with a kind of a more realistic 
form of art and then over time evolved and was one of the ones that moved away from Impressionism into abstraction and was uh, one of the chief architects of an art movement called Cubism. And uh, this was a painting called Guernica. And Guernica is a town in uh, northern Spain that during the Spanish Civil War where the royalists, the king, and the royalists were fighting against some insurgents that wanted to create a democracy and get rid of the king. The Germans were supporting the king and they sent their aircraft over and they just obliterated the town of Guernica. And this is Picasso's famous painting of that event. So you can see that this is nothing like a, the realism of a photograph. Now photography reacted to the realism in other ways as well. I mean, specifically as photographs. This is kind of a strange guy named Man Ray and uh, one of his photos. Now these are real things, but they're somewhat abstract in the same sense because they're kind of disconnected from anything. So the pepper just sitting there and the seashell, the Nautilus seashell that was cut in half and then you can just see the symmetry of the spiral there. So eventually we came to digital photography and in the early 1960s scientists at a couple of different laboratories that were really more involved with aerospace began to develop a technology that resulted in digital photography. And the key thing was to have a device that would replace film and that this device would be sensitive to light and be able to reproduce an image in the same way that film does, but it would be electronic. And that was the charge coupling device. First efforts were pretty crude, very small. By 1970, there was actually a video camera that was functioning as a digital video camera. They actually came up with a CCD device that could be sold and then used in other cameras. So by 1973, the CCD was available for other manufacturers to use. So one of the manufacturers is Kodak. And remember, George Eastman started Kodak in 1900 with his Brownie camera. Well, 75 years later, this is a prototype of the earliest digital camera that used that CCD. And it used a lens from actually a Kodak movie camera. And it wasn't small. It was uh, pretty heavy. And it only did black and white. And it actually stored it on a special cassette tape. And it took 23 seconds to record an image to tape. So you weren't getting anything that moved. But it worked. Eventually, other manufacturers, Sony, the Japanese company, jumps in with the Mavica and it recorded images on a floppy disk. Actually, if you go back a couple of decades where our computers used that little hard piece of plastic that was three and a half inches or so across, that was the floppy disk that was developed for the Mavica camera. But this early Mavica was a single lens reflex camera. In other words, you looked through the lens to take the photograph. They had interchangeable lenses, and it would record the image on the floppy disk, but then you had to take the floppy disk out and play it on a device that would show up on a TV. So it's really a video camera that took still images. So we were still waiting for the first true digital camera, and that really came about a couple years later when Minolta, another Japanese camera company, came up with a 35 millimeter format digital camera. And this was had the look and feel of a 35 millimeter SLR camera, had an autofocus sensor, and the motor 
that was in it, advanced the image. And then we came out with cameras in cell phones. And this is the first one that came out. It was built by Samsung and it came out in Korea in the year 2000. And it had a camera that was capable of recording 20 photographs at 0.35 megapixels. Now, you know, your typical smartphone camera now is over 10 megapixels. So this is really, really crude. And this was not really the kind of thing where you took the photographs and looked at them on the camera and shared them by passing the camera around. You had to hook it up to a computer to get your photos. So the digital revolution is the last part. It's really only been 16 years since we had the first digital camera in a phone. Here's some ways that the digital camera has really changed us. First off, we behave differently in public, not just because of the use of the phone, which is certainly a change in itself, but because of the camera. When we go to events, we typically take photographs with our cameras and we share them often on social media. But the point is to say, I was there. So you can see all the phone cameras that are being held up at the racetrack here, the Kentucky Derby. Another way it's changed this is just the sheer number of photographs being taken. It is astounding. Billions, billions of photographs are taken every day. This is six years ago, 2010. The Prince and Kate got married. They estimated that during the few days around the wedding, there were 327 million digital camera photos taken, photos or videos taken. Now that was six years ago. Another way that digital cameras have changed this is our photos are actually better. The digital camera has a lot of automated processes and whether you have the point and shoot camera like this Canon at the top or whether you have a smartphone like the one at the bottom that has a nice lens on it, you know, the work is done. You don't really set f-stops, you just they're just automated. And they have autofocus and really to make it hard, not impossible, but hard to take a technically bad photograph. Now, what you're taking the photograph and how you compose the image and maybe to a certain extent the light and that type of thing obviously makes it where we still have to develop skills to really take decent photographs. But we can take very decent photographs with a digital camera. Here's a couple of examples. I'd say those three photographs are as good as you're going to see, and they weren't taken with a single lens reflex expensive camera. Now, how has digital photography also changed this? Well, we're all citizen journalists, and we all have these cameras. They're video cameras as well as still cameras. So sometimes even something that happens becomes a big deal. It went black um, straight away and I felt like I'd been slapped all over. <laughs> I actually had to swim down and yank the bungee cord out of whatever it was caught into. When I was first pulled out of the water, they put me on my back and so all the water that I'd inhaled um, meant that I couldn't breathe. So um, I made them roll me onto my side and that's when I started coughing out water and blood. I think it's definitely a miracle that I survived. So let's hope we never experience anything like that. But the point is, 
Somebody had a camera there. I'm sure they didn't expect the bungee cord to break, but they recorded history. And just like we have seen photographs of police shootings of individuals, and we have seen just all manner of things, good and bad, it's because we're all capable of recording events with our digital cameras, and particularly our phone cameras. We're also all archivists. So we are taking the photographs and we are documenting the world and we are saving the photographs. You know, the question sometimes come up, will, will we forget how to remember things? No, I don't think so. But the memories we have are supplemented by the fact that we have these images with us. Now, I would say we need to do a better job of kind of curating our photographs. And so here's, here's my Flickr thing over here. And I don't put stuff up on Flickr without assessing it and doing maybe a little bit of editing on it. There are people that will go to an event, they'll take 300 photographs of a concert or something like that, and they'll dump all 300 of them up to Facebook and they go into a timeline and they disappear. But they're there difficult with Facebook to find the images, which is one of the reasons I recommend using Flickr. I think we could definitely do a better job of not saving everything. We can save the good stuff. Photography clearly has changed the world, and this little historical overview is going to be supplemented by a couple of short videos.